Well, welcome everyone to another Affinity Coffee Chat. Uh, my name is Brian Plogley. I look after customer success at Affinity. And today, uh, like we have in other times, I'm joined by uh, an investor, a, a VC, um, uh, Sakib Dadi. He's a vice president at Bessemer Ventures. And um, we're, we're gonna have, have a chat and then also really kind of dive into deal sourcing. Uh, I know a really um, topical thing that comes up in most customer conversations that at, that at least I have or folks on my team have. So um, let's, let's dive right in. Welcome, how are you? Hey, Brian, great to be here. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, maybe if you could just kind of uh, describe kind of <laughs> what is it that you do here at uh, Bessemer? So yeah. what, what's, what's your role and uh, what's your focus? Yeah, um, so I guess I can give a little bit of background on, on Bessemer, um, just sort of level set a little bit. I mean, we're a um, long-standing multi-stage um, venture capital firm um, investing across you know a bunch of different geographies um, Silicon Valley San Francisco where I'm based as well as um, New York Boston Israel India and now some satellite offices in London and China as well too um, but you know we invest very thematically as a firm like to go very deep into particular areas of focus you know sometimes starts out very broad as um, enterprise software back in the early 2000s when you know um, cloud computing and SaaS weren't really words and it was more ASP um, and is now sort of um, broken out into a, a bunch of different areas whether they be vertical specific more horizontal um, or things touching the infrastructure stack in particular which is where I spend a lot of my time um, at the early stages seed series A and series B um, so that's uh, that's a little bit about where I focus at least oh and, and I should ask so you're are you, are you guys, have you returned to work? Yeah, yeah, we're, I'm actually sitting in our office uh, right now. We just just got back to the office um, full-time, well, not full-time, three days out of the week, um, starting in March. So um, we're testing out if this office thing is real again. Um, <laughs> this will be all going back remote fully, um, but I, I, we're, we're enjoying it so far. That's great, that's great. And I, I should have also said we have to do our, um, you know, you know, I guess cheers <laughs> or whatever for on the coffee. Exactly. I didn't bring my Ember mug. The office didn't have them. Um, we just have the best Ember mugs. So. <laughs> yeah. And I should have asked, how, how do you take your coffee? Um, right now it's an Americano. Um, oh, I've, let's the Americano black. Um, I think the pandemic has definitely made me into more of a coffee addict than, than it should have. Um, and I'm yeah. drinking far more than two to three cups a day. <laughs> Hey, this is the no judge zone on on the amount of coffee. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Um, I have no shame in my coffee addiction at all. Yeah, totally. Um, well, let's let's um, maybe let's first uh, dive in a little bit on, around the market. Um, I know that it's it's ever evolving, very dynamic. Um, you know, we we chatted a few weeks ago, and I feel like the market dynamics are are vastly different now than they were then. But um, how how are you feeling about 2022 and just the overall market? Yeah, um, I think certainly over the past now couple of months, you started to see the public markets for um, technology really pull back a lot um, from where it was at like historic highs last year, and that is starting to filter into the growth stage. Although there is a lot of dry powder and funds still left. Folks have raised a bunch of funds over the past year or so um, that they have yet to deploy. Um, so I don't think we're gonna see an immediate pullback in things, especially at the later stage, um, especially at the early stage, I should say, um, just yet. Maybe the later stages will start to see a trickle down. Um, and over time, should this persist, um, you'll start to see a pullback as well too in the early stage and folks, Perhaps not, um, you won't see the same type of deal velocity at the same types of multiples that we've been seeing for the past year, year and a half or two years, especially as we were sort of coming out of the early throes of the pandemic um, in like July, August of 2020. Um, but I, I think, you know, as I think about some of my portfolio companies and the ones that I work with closely, um, it's really keeping them fixated on fundamentals. And this goes for prospective companies that we talk to. It's really thinking about are you growing efficiently? 
Um, and in a market pullback, venture investors in the capital markets tend to focus on that a lot more than growth at any cost. And I think folks will flee to efficiency more than they will to high, uh, you know, high growth companies that burn far more than they should be. Yeah. So almost like a back to basics. Kind Definitely. Of Definitely. Yeah. We will, we that will start sense. in a year or two. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then any, and do you see that from your, or at least from your point of view, do you see that changing as a, a, a bunch as we get towards the end of the year or what, what do you perceive kind of looking out uh, even yeah, deeper? The, the timing of when all this happens, I, I, I couldn't say. I, I don't have a good sense of like when exactly it'll happen. Um, at least for us uh, at Bessemer, we've been we've been preaching that for um, to our portfolio companies, not only recently but um, over the past year. That's sort of been a a, uh, a theme that that we try to hit on with everyone in our portfolio. That it is not just about growth at all costs, but doing so efficiently. Um, yeah. And I think you can start to see people talking about um, companies that way too. Um, and certainly some of the public market names that are growing really, really efficiently, um, they haven't been affected as deeply as maybe those that, that aren't as efficient. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, let's, let's start to dive into the top of the funnel. Um, and yeah. as that's our, our theme for, t for today, but, uh, maybe, maybe we just start there. Like, um, just generally, how, how do you all typically source? deals yeah um I, I don't think there's one strategy that works so if somebody was looking for the silver bullet on on this webinar uh, i don't have the answer for you, you can't just, say that you, you gotta yeah. say oh yeah i have yeah. all the answers i have exactly <laughs> one answer and it'll work for everybody all the time um <laughs> no I, I think folks do it really differently across the firm here um and there are multiple models that work and you sort of have to figure out the ones that work best for you and I think invest in it in a variety of ways. In many ways, it's like, it is like the startups that we invest in. It's not always that, um, you know, one acquisition tactic for them works best 100% of the time from, you know, seed all the way until they exit or go public. Um, it's about cultivating multiple sources and that's, you know, some of it is inbound. Um, you know, from other folks in your network, whether they be earlier stage investors, or later stage investors, where the opportunities aren't necessarily a fit, angel investors, or just, you know, employees of companies that you might know or are familiar with some of the products that um, you might be diligencing or interested in, um, to, you know, very targeted outbound that, hey, I'm excited about this one particular area, um, and I want to go really deep into it and talk to all what I believe to be the most interesting companies. Um, so there's multiple different paths to to go about doing it. And I think, you know, as an investor, it really behooves you to do um, or to invest in all of them um, or as many as you can and see what the results are and see what, uh, see what bears fruit from them too. Well, maybe let's, let's dive in a bit, a bit deeper. Um, like, uh, yeah, let's let's dive in a bit deeper there. What um, like what 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 are the sources or things that have you found that are you know unique or or innovative from your perspective, um, that that have worked really well? Yeah, um, I guess we can talk about it from both like the inbound and like quote unquote outbound side. Um, on the outbound side, I've generally found having a unique perspective, whether it be in an area that's a little undercovered or perhaps isn't, you know, at the top of everybody's tongue um, or top of mind for everybody um, in the venture community or in the investment community broadly just yet, is a really good place to start. One because those founders probably aren't getting hundreds of other emails from other investors every single day who are like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about your business. Let's set up 30 minutes on the Zoom call. Um, and so you can have, I think, a deeper, less transactional conversation with those folks. 
um, given that they may be not pressed for time with thousands of other investor conversations. Um, so that's one, maybe focusing on perhaps undercovered or, or historically underinvested in areas. And the second is if you do go outbound and you are trying to go after a company that's a little bit more, um, uh, uh, I guess, hot in the venture sense, um, you want to be really personalized and tailored to them too, right? Um, I think having a perspective as an investor, even if sometimes it's not necessarily correct, acknowledging that it's not always correct, that really helps you just get in the door with folks as well too. Um, and it lets you test your own thesis to see if it might be a good fit um, and you might be a good partner for the business moving forward. So that's on the outbound side. I think it's being, maybe having a unique perspective both on companies that you know, maybe everybody knows is interesting or thinks is interesting. And secondly, in areas that it's not interesting, that's important. And then inbound, um, you know, for um, getting deals from your network and getting the, the best out of that, it's investing in it in a less transactional way. I think I've, I've you know, even myself in the past, have definitely suffered from um, committing to relationships in a very transactional nature and making it very quid pro quo. Um, and oftentimes the best ones or or the folks that I found I get the best deal flow from in the long term are those where I've really just invested in the relationship, actually gotten to like know the person, talk to them, um, spend more than you know a 30 minute Zoom call every other month or quarter, and just gotten to connect with them on a personal level and talk to them about you know what excites me and talk to them about what excites them, um, and maybe just you know share some of our learning as well too. So it's about investing in, in less transactional relationships. And I think that makes you successful over the long term um, and not just in you know, the, the sort of quarterly or um, year long time frame that maybe we think about sometimes in the venture community is, hey, I have to do X number of deals or want to do X number of deals by this period of time, because that's, uh, that's not necessarily the right way to frame the question, I think. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm kind of a biased uh, source here coming from the relationship intelligence platform, you know, person, right? You know, um, but that that makes a ton of sense. I think your your comment about being first into an industry, obviously that that's super helpful too. Um, um, I guess one thing that's kind of been top of mind for me is how much has, have things changed like pre-pandemic um, with specifically with sourcing versus now? I mean, obviously there's the Zoom factor, but any, any anything else that has changed pretty dramatically? Um, yeah, I think definitely. So your point on sourcing, for sure. I think the the nature of sourcing has changed quite a bit. I mean, um, you know, as we've started to go back into the office, we're starting to have founders um, come back in to to meet with us, um, and it's just a very different feel. Um, I think Zoom, you can definitely have a lot of meetings very quick, back to back, um, and do a bunch of them. But it, it, there is an element that is missing from um, you know, having an in-person meeting and just getting to sit next to somebody or maybe whiteboard something or like sit right across the table from them and have a, a deep conversation. Um, and so that's been lost a little bit um, over the past two years. I think that'll, that'll start to come back though, for sure, as things open, are opening up. And then deal pace definitely has, has changed um, dramatically. You know, when I started venture in venture in 2015, the deal pace was totally different than it is in in 20 was in 2021, and even today it still is in 2022. Um, things are moving much much faster. From you know, you often had weeks um, to sort of prosecute a deal from beginning to end, and now it can feel like days, um, if not less than a day sometimes. Um, and that's I think affected decision making. Um, for a lot of folks and the way people source as well too. Um, but it goes back to some of the earlier points I made. I think that it's, you know, focusing on areas and in relationships where you don't necessarily feel those pressures will let you source not necessarily more deals, but better deals. Um, mm -hmm. And really get to companies and prospects that I think you'll be excited about and we'll generate, ideally, knock on wood, great returns for, for everybody. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, 
I guess just diving a, a bit deeper in the deal sourcing side of things. Um, are there any data sources that um, you, you have kind of added into your workflow or into kind of how you you all work that um, kind of fits in with the the sourcing um, kind of um, mantra for today? Yeah, um, I think nothing that's necessarily ex extremely unique, to be quite frank. Um, it's mostly a lot of public data sources, right? Um, you know, definitely leveraging LinkedIn and your relationship network as well, too. So if, another plug for Affinity, that definitely helps in that regard. Um, and then classic things like web traffic and, and the like. I find oftentimes the thing that is the most useful signal is just folks that I know who are potential customers or are already customers of certain products, like, you know, that sort of feedback is um, invaluable and, and oftentimes like the best signal for, um, you know, whether a company or, or product opportunity is, is really, really exciting and you should be taking a closer look. Um, and the biggest mistakes that I've made as, a, as an investor is ignoring that signal and sort of being like, oh, that's, you know, my preconceived notion of it is right rather than really questioning um, my own thinking because somebody's like, hey, you should check this out. Um, this is actually a really interesting product and like really digging with them to understand why. Um, so I think the the maybe less quantitative signal and a more qualitative signal like that is really, really valuable. And, and as an early stage investor, especially worth really taking seriously. So then is that uh, kind of baked into your process then? It is, I think it's, you know, having Again, back to the point of, of you know leveraging your network um, and investing in it, having not just those types of relationships with earlier stage investors or later stage investors, but also you know folks who you know are buyers and customers or users of these products um, in the places that you're investing in. That's you know um, if not more important oftentimes than some of those other ones, um, and so that is all in your network. Um, and all things that you should be trying to leverage and develop and actively invest in. Got it. Um, cool. Um, one thing that I've been processing is how 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 do folks evaluate like um, different types of kind of deal sourcing kind of techniques, um, and you know like what w which ones are effective, which which ones aren't. Um, how how much have you dove into that and and think about that? Like how do, how do you just say like oh, all right? I mean obviously like oh wow we you know we got this deal source and it's Snowflake and it's I mean you know that, that those ones are easy. Um, but uh, how, how do you do that more uh, programmatically? Yeah, no, it's tough because I, I don't I don't think we do it in nearly like a um, structured way as you know what we expect our companies our, our portfolio companies to do with their sales and marketing funnels uh, where it's very um, data driven. Um, you calculate all the metrics on it, calculate what's the most efficient, and you encourage them to invest in them. Um, it's a little bit more of a um, perhaps feeling than it is like quantitatively driven. That, hey, this, you know, I'm finding that this particular area or this way of in, you know, sourcing a deal, like whether it's, you know, reaching out outbound to a company, a bunch of companies in an area that you're just starting to get excited about, or hey, I'm chatting with you know um, one of these bigger cloud providers who's a partner to a bunch of companies, um, is you know seeing a bunch of interesting startups pop up there. Um, it's it's a little bit more of a gut feeling than it is, I think, quantitatively driven in some ways. Um, so maybe again, not a silver bullet answer to folks, um, and something you just have to sort of develop over time. But um, I, I truly do think that's at least the way I do it, and, and I've, I've seen a lot of folks do it. Gotcha. Um, so maybe it sounds like it's more of a qualitative, you know, checking in than than quantitative. Definitely. I think every quarter or so, you should probably look back and think like, hey, um, what were the best? What were the right sources or the best sources that I felt like I was getting a lot out of? Um, and what was working there? Um, maybe it's a quarter, maybe it's every month, sort of the, at some regular cadence. You should you sort of reflect on that and think about it. Well, I know that you said that there isn't like the one magic silver bullet, but this is this is kind of the time of the program where I say, hey. <laughs> 
what is the silver bullet? Yeah, that one share uh, all the secrets on the silver bullet. Yeah, the one unique uh, differentiated channel that you have. Um, I know you don't want to um, share too many, um, you know, too much intellectual property uh, state secrets. But if you do have a, a recommendation of like the one thing, what, what would you say? Um, I, I don't think it's a secret at all. I, I think this is pretty obvious, perhaps, um, but, it, but it, it's worth repeating. Um, investing in your network is not just one-off transactional kind of relationships or conversations. It's actually really taking time to speak with folks who you're close to and sort of just bounce ideas off of and learn from, as well as expanding that network over time as well too. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the most successful investors that have been doing it for decades plus um, really benefit from that over the long term. You know, as, as investors, it's funny, our jobs are to invest in companies over, you know, a seven to 10 year time frame. generally is how long these things take to go from initial investment to exit. And yet I don't think we think about that, our sourcing tactics in necessarily the same way. Um, but you should, it is also an investment in, in its own way. And those relationships don't often bear fruit very, very early on in maybe the first year or two um, when you start out in venture and you start out your career, but bear a lot of fruit towards the end um, and bear a lot of fruit in the out years. And so you have to invest in them upfront knowing that. Um, and I think it, it, people intuitively know this or, or they know this and they'll say it like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. But um, then it's hard to follow through because it doesn't immediately show impact just yet. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, uh, that makes sense. All right. Any any other um, parting tips that you have for the, for the audience on on deal sourcing, get it, finding things top of the funnel? If anyone has a silver bullet, they they should just email me directly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have their perspective on it as well too. I mean. Um, I think you, you, you have to find what works best for you. I think having a combination of both inbound from folks and outbound, um, is a good way to do it. Not just because it helps you explore, you know, when you're doing outbound driven sourcing, explore some of your own hunches or intuitions for what might be an interesting area or things you explicitly know are an interesting area. Um, but it also helps you build your network and then your network challenges you to think about new areas and then you do more outbound sourcing. You know, these are like, some folks think about them just siloed. They each do their own thing and they're very different, but the funnels do play off of each other as well too. Um, and even in your best portfolio companies, there's probably some amount of product led um, growth. And eventually at some point, some outbound sales layered onto that as well too, that works in tandem with that other motion also. Um, and so I, I, to the extent I can encourage folks um, to do both, I, I, I'd do that. Yeah, great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me about um, what you're seeing in the market as well as uh, uh, on the sourcing side of things. Um, hopefully we didn't get you in too much trouble with all the state secrets that you did. <laughs> Shared. Uh, but this is this has really been helpful. I really appreciate your time. And I guess thank you to everybody for joining and listening in and and uh, check back into the next coffee chat that's coming uh, coming soon. Thanks a ton. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone.